Welcome once again to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. We've been studying together for a number of weeks now. If we understand scripture yet don't understand how to live a victorious Christian life day by day, it doesn't have a lot of meaning, does it? That's what Pastor Cox is going to deal with tonight, how you and I can have a victorious experience in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be defeated day after day. You can overcome. You can be happy and joyful in the Lord. Tonight, I promise you'll receive a special blessing as you learn how to live a victorious Christian life. Appreciate very much each of you being here. We have had a wonderful time together the last three weeks. Every time in the history of man when people have not been free Man has been willing to do anything to get his freedom, even to giving up life itself. Places freedom very, very high on the list and will do most anything to be free. Jesus spoke about that. He had this to say about it. He said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Freedom is not always involved in where you're at. Because I have known people that were in prison that were free. Not always the building that confines us makes us prisoners. There's a lot of people that are out outside of prison that are not free. They're prisoners. They're in bondage. Jesus tried to get this idea across to his people, to the Jewish people in his day. He tried to get across to them what was involved in being free, not being in bondage. But they couldn't understand it. The only thing that they could think of was in terms of being in bondage to another nation. They couldn't understand that there was such a thing as spiritual bondage. It just didn't dawn on them. It didn't lighten their mind. They couldn't understand it. You see, the Bible talks about going into bondage, being in bondage, and it speaks of being in bondage, not just physically, but it talks about being in bondage spiritually. In fact, it says here in Ephesians 2 and verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of what? Wrath just as others. You see, it is possible for an individual to be born into slavery. There's some of you here tonight that your forefathers were born into slavery. But it's also possible, in fact, it is with each one of us that we are born into spiritual bondage. We are born as children of wrath. That's the way we come into the world. We are born with fallen natures, sinful natures, and we are children of wrath, bondage, in bondage spiritually. There are other people that have gone into bondage by force. Someone has literally forced them into bondage. And there's some of you here that your forefathers were taken by force and made slaves. As you remember, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were taken by Nebuchadnezzar and really forced into bondage. It is possible to be forced into bondage spiritually. Listen to what it says. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by what? Force. You see, some people have never got that clear. You see, God very, very seldom uses force. I find some people that they... Uh, they feel that they've got to be forced. They're waiting for God to grab them by the nap of the neck and shake them. And if he'd just grab them by the nap, nap of the neck and shake them real hard, well, then they'd say, well, I'll do what the Lord wants me to do. The Lord doesn't work that way. 
But let me tell you a little secret. The devil does. I mean, he'll put all the pressure he can put on you. He believes in force. And he will do everything he can to keep you from doing that which is right. He doesn't mind using force at all. And there are many people that have been taken into bondage by force. It also says that there's people that have been sold into slavery. You remember Joseph's brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites on the way down to Egypt. And when he got to Egypt, you remember, they put him on the auction block and auctioned him off, sold him into slavery. There's some of you folks here whose forefathers were sold into slavery. The Bible says that we're sold into slavery spiritually. Thus says the, Lord, says the Lord, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce whom I have put away? Or which one of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourselves. And for your transgressions, your mother has been put away. So it says that we sell ourselves into slavery by our iniquities, by our sins. We are taken into slavery. Christ was trying to get these principles across to his people. In fact, he told them they were in slavery, told them they were in bondage. And when he did this, this is how they replied. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and we're never in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will, you will be made free? He, they said, we're children of Abraham. We're, we're not in bondage to anybody. What do you mean we'll be made free? And listen to Jesus' answer. Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. See, I am a slave of sin if I don't understand the freedom that there is in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of ways that people have gotten out of slavery over the years. You can remember that there are some people that have gotten out of slavery simply by buying their way out. They just saved up enough money, had some friends, relatives that gave them money, and they got enough money to buy their freedom. There were some people in the days of slavery that got out by buying their freedom. It's possible physically to buy your freedom. Is it possible to buy your freedom spiritually? Well, if you're going to buy your freedom, you see, the owner has to be willing to sell, doesn't he? And the devil's not willing to sell. So you're not going to buy your freedom spiritually. And there's some people that have gotten out of slavery by force. They were just big enough, strong enough, that they said, I'm not going to be a slave anymore, and they forced their way out. People physically got out of slavery that way. You think you can get out of bondage spiritually that way? No, I don't think there's any of us here that are stronger than the devil. So you're not going to force your way out with him. And there are some people that got out of slavery by running away. They ran off, said, I'm not going to be a slave anymore. I don't know that that's really freedom. You know, if you're always looking over your shoulder, I don't know how free that is. But nevertheless, they ran off. But spiritually, you can't do that. There's no way you can go where you can run off where the devil won't find you. Impossible. And, of course, there were some people, a lot of people that got out of slavery simply by being released. Proclamation of emancipation set them free, released. Now, physically, they were released from slavery. Spiritually, we're not going to get out of slavery that way because the devil's not going to release anybody. So what I want to ask you tonight is if you can't buy your way spiritually, you can't force your way spiritually, you can't run away spiritually, the devil's not going to release you how are you going to get out of bondage? How are you going to get out of spiritual bondage if none of those things work? Well, I want to share with you how you get out. This is what it says. 
It says, for we know that the law is spiritual. Now, the law, not anything wrong with the law. The law is spiritual. But I am carnal, what? Sold under sin. That law holds me in bondage because I am guilty. You follow me? I have sinned. And because we have sinned, the law, which is good, the law is good, holy, just, not anything wrong with the law, but it holds you in bondage. How am I going to get out from that bondage? How am I going to get out of that slavery? But now, we have been delivered from the law. Mm. The law that held me, said, you're guilty, holds me in bondage. I have been delivered from the law. Let's see how I'm delivered from the law. Having what? Come on. Died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Let me ask you something. If I am in bondage, if I am a slave, and I'm a slave all my life, when I die, am I a slave any longer? No. So the only way you get out of spiritual bondage and spiritual slavery is by dying. You can't get out any other way. Impossible. That's what it says. The law is going to hold you until you die spiritually. This is what Paul's talking about when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You must be willing to crucify the old man of sin. And until you crucify the old man of sin, you're not free. That's the way you get free. There's a lot of people that go all the way through their life in bondage spiritually because they have never died. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. You can't buy your way out, but you can die. That we can do. And he talks about it some more. And says here, knowing this, that the old man, that's the old man of sin. You understand what I'm talking about? That's the old carnal nature. That's the old nature that goes contrary to God. The old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer serve sin. You see what he's talking about? You've got to take the old man of sin and you've got to crucify that old man of sin and then that brings freedom. For he who has died has been freed from sin. As long as you're going to take the old man of sin and you're going to take that old man of sin and you're going to feed it and you're going to nurture it, dear friend, you're going to be a slave all your life. But when that old man of sin is crucified, you have been set free. I'm talking about how to live a victorious Christian life. You can't until you crucify the old man of sin. That you have to do. Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, it's talking about the victory over the devil. Destroyed him. All right, listen, it continues in the book of Hebrew. And delivered those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see, he says he's going to set them free. But I have to be willing to die to the old man of sin. That's necessary. Now, I want you to follow me very carefully because I'm going to talk to you about two laws. Two laws that very few people understand. And yet those two laws work in your life and you, they make all the difference in the world. Here, the book of Romans, it talks about it. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me what? 
free from the law of sin and death. Two laws, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. Those are two laws. This law of sin and death, I want you to understand some basic things about the law of sin and death. Let's look at a few. To begin with, the law of sin and death is stronger than you are and delivered those who through fear of death all their lifetime were subject to bondage. That law of sin and death, you cannot overcome it by willpower. It's stronger than you. There's no way that you can be victorious over it. It's something you don't have the power to be victorious over. Not only that law of sin and death, but you're born under it. When you come into the world, that law of sin and death is automatically working in your life. I mean, it starts right there. And you cannot, you cannot just say, well, I'm not going to have it operate anymore. It just doesn't work that way. And a lot of people go through life not understanding what's going on because the law of sin and death is working in their life. It's working against them, and they wonder, why do I do those things? Why do I continue to do these things over and over? It's because the law of sin and death is there. That's what Paul's talking about. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, so under sin. That law of sin and death is working in my life. Also, you'll find that this law of sin and death is stronger than our willpower. Our willpower is not strong enough to change it. It won't change it. It won't make any difference in it whatsoever. Do you understand what I'm saying? Huh? You understand what I'm talking about? That law of sin and death is stronger. Now, there may be some of you sitting out there saying, well, let me tell you something. Even though you can't see it, even though you can't feel it, even though it shows no signs, you better believe it's there. Just like there's a law right here, a law called the law of gravity. gravity. If I was to take this Bible and hold it out at arm's length, how long do you think I can hold it out there? Huh? Somebody says five minutes. Why will that get heavier? Huh? There's a law. It's a law called gravity. And I can tell you, it will pull. I can't see it. I can't feel it. But boy, when I stick it out there, it works. You know, just like the Indian that killed the deer. Had to take it into town to register it and hang it up and weigh it. And he carried it over two mountains and got into town and hung it on the scale. He said, 65 pounds. And he said, let it hang there a while. It'll get heavier. <laughs> and that's, that's the law of gravity. You see, it works. Now, you may not can see the law of sin and death, but it will work. And it works very, very real. So your willpower just isn't strong enough to overcome it. All right, there's also another law. That law is called the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. That law is stronger than the law of sin and death. You see, there's another law other than gravity. There's a law called the law of aerodynamics that's stronger than gravity. This law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus is stronger than the law of sin and death. Listen to some things about it. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is stronger than the law of sin and death. You have to establish that to begin with. The trouble of it is is you're not born with the law of the spirit of life. You're not born with that one. 
you're born with the law of sin and death. See, that's what's wrong. A lot of people don't understand. You're born with the law of sin and death working. You're not born with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that's the way that happens. You see, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is given at conversion. That's when that law comes into operation. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you give him your heart, then the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus begins to work, begins to operate in your life. It is stronger than the other. This is what it says. But now we have been delivered from the law. We have been delivered from the law of sin and death. Having died to what we were held by, I've taken the old man of sin. I have crucified him. I have come to the Lord and now the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus is working in my life so that we should not so that we should serve in the newness of the letter, excuse me, in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, that's where all that happens. Now, I'm talking about how to live a victorious Christian life. The first thing I'm going to tell you is you come to Christ and then after you have come to Christ, you're going to have to take the old man of sin and you're going to have to crucify him. If you don't crucify the old man of sin, you're never going to get any victory. When I crucify the old man of sin, now the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus begins to work in my life. And when it starts working in my life, then it says, having been set free from sin, we become servants of righteousness. Sets me free. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, took the old man of sin, crucified him with Jesus Christ. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer serve sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now listen carefully. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. See, if I die with him, I'm going to live with him also. Okay. When you crucify the old man of sin, and the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus comes into your life, you know what's going to happen? The Bible says that you will produce fruit. I run on to a lot of Christians that, that are over here. They're still in the old man of sin. They have never crucified the old man of sin, and they wonder why their lives are so ineffective and why it doesn't produce any fruit. Let me tell you, producing fruit is something that comes natural. You don't work at that. It produces fruit automatic. And when the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus begins to work in your life, you will produce fruit. Listen. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you may be married to another. You understand what that's saying? I was married to the law of sin and death, but I crucified the old man of sin that I might be married to another, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. Even to him who has been raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. But now having been set free from sin and having become servants of God, you have your fruit in holiness and the end everlasting life. That's the way that happens. That's the way it takes place. Okay. You see, I need to be free. And as I come and the old man is crucified, it says that I have been set free. But you were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You see, when I come to the Lord, I crucify the old man of sin. 
the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus begins to work in my life, I will begin to produce fruit. That's a natural thing. I'm talking about how to live a victorious Christian life. It's what we're talking about. All right. Someone may say, well, <laughs> that's fine, but how do you produce more fruit? I'd literally like to produce more fruit than I'm producing. How can I have more fruit? Well, let's see. The Bible will tell you how. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done. Now, you know, I run on people say, well, i tell you what, uh, I'm going to have to work harder. I, I'm going to have to do more, and I'll produce more fruit. No, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the what? Now, listen carefully. He's telling you how to produce more fruit. You produce more fruit, you see, simply by having more of the Holy Spirit. That's the way you produce more fruit. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Do you know what he's talking about? Huh? Now, I preached just this morning on how to receive the baptism of what? The Holy Spirit. It says that out of that person will flow rivers of living water. Listen to what he's talking about. But this he spoke concerning the what? The Spirit, whom those who believe in him would receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. It says that out of you will flow rivers of living water, and he's referring to the Holy Spirit. And if you want to produce more fruit, the way you produce more fruit is by having more of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the way it comes. It's the way it happens. But I know that there are people that are saying, well, <laughs> that's fine, Brother Cox, uh, but how do you have more of the Holy Spirit? I'd like to produce more fruit, and I can produce more fruit by having more of the Holy Spirit, but how can I have more of the Holy Spirit? Okay. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? You want to have more of the Holy Spirit, you know how you get it? Faith. That's the way you receive more of the Holy Spirit is by faith. In fact, you'll find that it ties the Holy Spirit and faith together over and over in the Scripture. Listen as it talks about some of the men, the deacons in the Bible. It says, and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the what? See, they go together. So if you want to have more of the Holy Spirit, you get more of the Holy Spirit by having more faith. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Some of you are saying, Brother Cox, my faith's pretty weak. I don't have much faith. Well, I'm going to tell you how to have faith because this is what it says. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You see, dear friend, if I get into the book and if I'll read the book, I spend time in God's Word, I'll have more faith, and with more faith, I'll have more of the Holy Spirit, and with more of the Holy Spirit, I'll produce more fruit. I'm telling you how to live a victorious Christian life. That's the way it comes. You can't go through life and not spend any time with this, dear friend. You've got to get into the book. You've got to open up your heart. You've got to look at it. And I can tell you, it'll make all the difference in your, the world in your life. Change your whole life. You talk about blessings. You talk about joy. You talk about peace. You talk about love. That comes with this. Your life's not happy then come to the Lord. Turn your life over to him. He'll make all the difference in the world in it. But this is the way you live a Christian life. Now, this thing of faith, we ought to talk about faith just for a moment because faith involves certain things. You need to understand it. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You see, faith is a gift. And God tells me that if I will spend time in God's Word, He'll give me faith. My faith will grow. It'll become stronger and stronger. There's certain things about faith you need to understand. First, you see, faith has to do with your attitude. A lot of people don't have very much faith because they don't have the right attitude. If you're going to have faith, your attitude's going to have to be right. It says, and having been set free from sin, we became servants of... You see, faith will only operate in a surrendered attitude. I've got to take the old man of sin, I've got to crucify him, and I have to turn my life over to the Lord. I can tell you right now, if you think the Lord is going to accept the old man of sin, if you think he's going to accept your pride, if you think he's going to accept your jealousy, if, he th if you think he's going to accept your egotism, he's not. He won't accept that. That's the old man of sin. And you want to see what it says about it? This is what happens. And whoever falls on this stone will be what? I can tell you right now, until you have fallen on the rock, Jesus Christ, and been broken, it won't work. I find people that come to the Lord, but they don't want to fall on the rock. They don't want to be broken. Won't work. And if you don't come and your old man of sin is not crucified, if you're not there and if you don't understand the struggle, and if you don't understand what's going on in your soul and the old man of sin is taken and killed, broken, then you haven't understood conversion yet. Now, if you don't want to do that, then that text tells you what happens. Because it says, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. If you don't fall on that rock, and are broken, I can tell you at the coming of the Lord, that rock's going to fall on you. My attitude must be one of surrender. That it must be. Secondly, faith not only affects the attitude, but it also affects the will. I have to make a decision. I have to say, yes, this is what I'm going to do. Like the prodigal son out there feeding the pigs. And he made a decision. He said, I will, what? Arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. He made the decision. He said, I will. God is not going to take you contrary to your will. He's not going to do that. It's a decision you have to make. You have to say, yes, this is what I'm going to do. And if you do that, then he will gladly accept you. And thirdly, faith also affects the affections. It has to do with my affections. If your affections are not involved in faith, then faith really isn't there. Listen, Paul talks about it. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Paul said, I'd really like for my people to be saved. I want them to be. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge. He said, oh, they've got a zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. Listen, he finishes up. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. You see, I've got to see clearly that my righteousness is as filthy rags. Nothing good in me. Even all my best motives is tainted. I have to understand that I desperately, so desperately need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When I understand that and I understand that he paid my debt, 
I understand that he lived a perfect life for me. I understand that he has accomplished everything that's necessary for me to have eternal life. Then I can come to him. And you better believe my affections are very much tied up in Jesus Christ. Makes all the difference in the world. Dear friend, until you know that, only then are you free. That is freedom. That's what makes a person free. We have had slavery here in this country. And in the South on a plantation was a slave. His name was John. John was a great, big, stalwart, huge man. John was so big and so strong that he could do the work of ten men. And the plantation owner worked him like ten men. Every day, from sunup to dark, he worked John. John had done it for years until John was full of it up to here. And one day John decided he wasn't going to work anymore. That was it. Decided wasn't going to work anymore. And that morning when all the slaves went out to the field to work, John didn't go. And that evening when the plantation owner came in, he went out to John's cabin. He said, are you sick, John? And John said, no, I'm not sick. He said, why didn't you go to work? And John said, I'm not working anymore. And the plantation owner said, you're what? And he said, I'm not working anymore. And he said, John, let me tell you something. When the sun comes up in the morning, you better be out there in the field. If you aren't, I'll beat you to death. The next morning, John didn't go. And when they came in that evening, the plantation owner took some of the other slaves and they went over to John's cabin. And he said, John, I told you to be at work this morning. And John said, I know. He said, why didn't you go to work? He said, because I'm not working anymore. And the plantation owner had those other slaves tie him up, tied him up to a post, and he took a horse whip peeled the shirt off his back and he beat John and beat John and beat John across the back until his whole back was bloody. And he said, now I'm telling you, if you don't go to work in the morning, I'll beat you to death. But the next morning, John didn't go to work. And that evening when plantation owner came in again, they strung him up. And again, he took a whip. He lashed him back and forth across the back until finally John fell unconscious. And the plantation owner went in the house. And after an hour or so, he came back out. And he told John when he gained consciousness, I'm telling you, if you don't go to work in the morning, tomorrow's your last day of life. But the next morning, John didn't go to work. And that evening when he came in, plantation owner, he took those men out there and they tied him up again and he beat on him and beat on him and beat on him till he was unconscious, laying there, didn't look like he had any life in him. The plantation owner went in the house. He said, I'm going to beat the man to death. If I do, what do I gain? What do I gain if I kill him? I'll just let his wounds heal. I'll let his back heal. And when he's all healed up, I'll take him down to the auction and auction him off. At least I'll get some money out of him. And so he let John's wounds all heal. And after he was well and strong again, tied him up and took him down to the auction, put him up on the auction block, stripped him to the waist. There John stood great, big, huge biceps bulging. And they began to bid for John. 
man over here bid, then another man, and then another man, and the price continued to go up until finally it reached the place where slaves like John normally sold for. And then all of a sudden, somebody over there bid again. And then another person. And John began to get excited. And somebody bid over there, and he said, the reason he's selling me is because I won't work. And then a man over there bid, and he said, you're crazy, I won't work. And then another one bid, and he said, I'm telling you, I won't work. And the bid went up and up until finally a man bought him, took John and put him in his wagon, took him out to the plantation, took him out of the wagon and untied his hands and his feet. And he said, John, you're free. He said, I've just bought your freedom. You can go. You're a free man. Just make your way. You're no longer a slave. The plantation owner turned and walked in the house, and John stood there by the wagon and said, free? Free? And after a little bit, the plantation owner came out, and he said, John, I'm sorry. He said, I should have understood. He said, you need something to show that your freedom's been purchased. Here, I've written it out on paper. I've signed it. You're a free man. And he gave it to John. He said, now go, you're free. And John stood there and said, free? What does he mean, free? Where am I going to go? After a bit, the plantation owner came out and said, John, it's getting dark. There's a cabin over there. There's a bed. There's food. You can spend the night there, and in the morning you can go on your way. And John went over and spent the night in the cabin. The next morning when he got up, went out, the plantation owner met him and said, it's a new day, John. You're a free man. You can go. And John said, free? Where am I going to go? Who's going to believe me? What am I going to do? He said, you're the only one that's ever done anything for me. You're the only one that's ever cared about me. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here. I want to work for you. Oh, dear friends, that's what it's all about with Jesus Christ. He's the one that loves us. He's the one that's done something for us. Nobody else. He's the one that died for you. He's the one that's willing to set you free. Only in Christ, nobody else. That's the way that you and I receive freedom, we're in bondage. Jesus Christ has set you free, made you free in him. I want you to listen. Steve sings about that freedom. We thank you. God bless you all. Good night.